They were the Persuaders, two international playboys who teamed up to fight crime and charm women along the French Riviera. But behind the scenes, Roger Moore and Tony Curtis had a less than harmonious relationship that threatened to derail their hit show. The show premiered on ITV and ABC in 1971 and became an instant success, although a relatively short-lived one. The chemistry between Moore and Curtis was undeniable on screen as they traded quips and punches with equal flair. But while the fans loved them, Moore and Curtis did not always love each other. Facts First presents Why Roger Moore and Tony Curtis Didn't Get On During the Persuaders Casting a Classic The Persuaders was a British TV series that followed the adventures of two wealthy and charismatic men who were recruited by a retired judge to solve crimes and mysteries around the world. The show was a mix of action, comedy, and romance, and featured exotic locations and glamorous guest stars. The two main characters were Danny Wilde, played by Tony Curtis, a self-made American millionaire who grew up in the Bronx and had a streetwise attitude and a snazzy sense of style, and Lord Brett Sinclair, portrayed by Roger Moore, a refined English aristocrat who was educated at Harrow and Oxford and had a suave demeanor and a classic style. The show was created by Lou Grade, a British media mogul who wanted to produce an international hit that would appeal to both American and European audiences. The casting of Moore and Curtis was partly influenced by their previous roles. Moore had played Simon Templar in The Saint for six seasons, which made him popular among British viewers. Curtis, on the other hand, had starred in Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe, which made him famous among American viewers. Grade also wanted to capitalize on their star power and charisma, as they were both handsome and charming actors who could attract female fans. Moore agreed to do the show because he liked the idea of working with Curtis, whom he admired as an actor. He also wanted to do something different from The Saint, which he felt had become dull and repetitive. Curtis agreed to do the show because he wanted to revive his career after some flops in Hollywood. He also liked the idea of living in Europe for a while. The Persuaders premiered on ITV in Britain on September 17, 1971. It debuted on ABC in America on September 18, 1971. Opposites Attract one of the main sources of conflict between Moore and Curtis was their different approaches to acting. Moore was a classically trained actor who preferred to stick to the script and rehearse his lines, while Curtis was a natural improviser who liked to ad lib and change up his dialogue on the spot. This led to many clashes on set, as Moore felt Curtis was unprofessional and disrespectful, while Curtis felt Moore was stiff and boring. Moore later recalled, quote, he would come onto the set with pages of dialogue he'd written that morning. I would say, Tony, I spent all night learning these lines, and now you want me to throw them away. He would reply, you're not Marlon Brando. Garlic Breath and Uneven Paychecks Another source of friction was their personal habits. Moore was a neat freak who liked everything to be in order, while Curtis was more of a slob who left his clothes and belongings everywhere. Moore also disliked Curtis's heavy use of garlic, which made their close-up scenes rather unpleasant. Moore also resented Curtis's higher salary, which he felt was unfair given that he had more screen time and did most of his own stunts. Curtis reportedly earned $1 million per season, while Moore earned $750,000. Moore later said he never quite understood why Curtis got more money. But despite their differences, Moore and Curtis managed to maintain a mostly cordial working relationship for the sake of the show. They both had a sense of humor and enjoyed playing pranks on each other. They also respected each other's talents and achievements. The tension paid off. Their on-screen chemistry was undeniable, as they portrayed two contrasting characters who bickered but ultimately bonded over their common goals. Their witty banter and playful rivalry added spice and charm to their adventures. Their off-screen tension also helped create publicity for the show, as fans were curious about their real-life relationship. The media often reported on their fights and feuds, which generated interest and intrigue among viewers. Popular yet short-lived The Persuaders was a very expensive show to produce, costing about £100,000 per episode, about $1.5 million in today's money. It was partly funded by Lou Grade's brother Bernard Delfont, who owned several theaters and cinemas in Britain. 
The series was also costly because it was filmed on location in various countries like France, Italy, Monaco, and Switzerland using real castles, villas, and hotels. It also featured many luxury cars, such as an Aston Martin DBS for Moore and a Ferrari Dino 246 GT for Curtis. The series had a catchy theme tune composed by John Barry, who also wrote the music for several James Bond films. The theme was nominated for a Grammy Award in 1972 for Best Instrumental Theme. The opening credits of the show featured a split-screen montage of scenes from the childhood and adulthood of the two main characters, contrasting their different backgrounds and personalities. Originally, The Persuaders was conceived as a vehicle for Cary Grant and Rock Hudson, but they both turned it down. Moore suggested Curtis as his co-star after seeing him on stage in London. Curtis agreed to do the show, partly because he wanted to work with Moore and partly because he wanted to escape from his troubled marriage to actress Christine Kaufman. While the series was very popular in Europe and Australia, it wasn't nearly as successful in America. It aired on ABC at 10 p.m. on Saturdays, which was not a good time slot for its target audience. It also faced stiff competition from other shows like All in the Family and Mission Impossible. Because of this, it only aired 24 episodes before being canceled. The show has gained a cult following over the years among fans of classic TV shows and action comedy genres. It's been released on DVD and Blu-ray with various extras like documentaries, commentaries, and interviews with Moore and Curtis. It's also inspired some homages and parodies in other media such as comics, films, and TV shows. Post Persuaders Pals After The Persuaders was cancelled, Tony Curtis and Roger Moore pursued different paths. However, they remained friends until Curtis's death in 2010. Curtis returned to Hollywood and continued to act in films and TV shows, but with less success than before. He appeared in comedies like The Last Tycoon, Sextet, The Bad News Bears Go to Japan, as well as The Boston Strangler and Insignificance. He also starred in a short-lived sitcom called McCoy from 1975 to 76, where he played a con artist. Curtis later faced some personal challenges, such as drug addiction, divorce, and health problems. He married six times and had six children, including actress Jamie Lee Curtis. He became an avid painter and wrote several books about his life and career. He died from cardiac arrest at age 85 on September 29, 2010. Moore moved on to his most famous role as James Bond, 007, replacing Sean Connery. He starred in seven Bond films from 1973 to 85, Live and Let Die, The Man with the Golden Gun, The Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, For Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, and A View to a Kill. He was celebrated for bringing a lighter touch and more humor to the character than his predecessors. He also appeared in other films such as The Wild Geese, Cannonball Run, the Curse of the Pink Panther, and Spice World. He also did some voice work for animated films like Cats and Dogs, The Revenge of Kitty Galore. He was married four times and had three children. He was also involved in humanitarian work as a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF since 1991. He received several honors for his services to entertainment and charity, such as a knighthood in 2003. Moore died of cancer at age 89 on May 23, 2017. Despite their different lifestyles and careers, Moore and Curtis remained close friends. They kept in touch by phone and email, visited each other occasionally, attended each other's events, and supported each other's causes. They also shared some fond memories of their time on The Persuaders, such as the exotic locations they visited, the stunts they performed, the jokes they played on each other, and the fans they met. They both considered it one of their favorite projects. They furthermore defended each other from critics who dismissed their show as superficial or outdated. They argued it was meant to be fun and entertaining rather than realistic or serious. They said it had a lasting appeal because of its charm, style, and chemistry. Despite the tension that they famously had between them, they both agreed they had a good off- and on-screen relationship. At the end of the day, they were two very different people who shared an unforgettable sense of humor. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you think The Persuaders would have been as successful if it weren't for the on- and off-screen tensions between Roger Moore and Tony Curtis? Let us know in the comments section below.